Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you back to today's Hindu newspaper analysis. I hope all of you are doing good. Your preparation also is going right on track. We are back once again to analyze the most important news stories from the Hindu newspaper of today for both the mains and the prelims examination point of view. I really hope that by now all of you would have already subscribed to our YouTube channel. If not, please make sure you do hit the subscribe button and make it a habit of joining in right here on time every single day at 10 a.m. Before we start analyzing the Hindu newspaper for today, there is an important announcement for all of you. We have a live workshop for all of you Saturday 6 p.m. I will be taking this workshop where we will be discussing specifically if you are preparing for the 2024 attempt, what are the seven steps that you have to keep in mind to ensure that your first attempt becomes your best attempt. Don't forget to join us for this workshop. Please remember this workshop will be on the Baiju's exam prep app and not on YouTube. I'm sure many of you already would have the app. Just in case you don't have the app, please make sure download the Baiju's exam prep app. Attend this live workshop where you can ask whatever doubt you have about your preparation. Now, these are the important topics that we have here lined up for you today. From the mains examination point of view, we will have discussion on these four topics. Number one, India's DPI. DPI basically refers to the progress that India is making in the digital interface specifically. The government of India, as you know, has been introducing a lot of technology in the form of e-governance initiatives. You can talk about Aadhaar, you can talk about online initiatives of the government of India to connect with the people. We'll be discussing about the importance of such initiatives and going forward what can we learn from that. Then the next topic of discussion will be about strikes. Basically a lot of states are seeing strikes from the workers who are demanding going back to the old pension scheme. The government in response is forcing the workers to come back by using the essential services law. We will be discussing what is the essential services law. Is it right to force the workers to come back to work or do the workers have the right to strike? Then the Russia-Belarus nexus, we will be discussing about what is the relationship between the two. Belarus, as you know, is one of the neighbors of Russia where Russia has recently announced that they will be setting up some of their nuclear weapons in Belarus. So we'll be discussing about the relationship of the two. Then India's solar photovoltaic waste problem. The issue that the entire world is facing, how to dispose solar power waste, the solar cells which have expired which have lived their life, now what to do with them. Then we'll be discussing some topics from the prelims point of view. Number one, army, that is the Indian army, will get satellites and they will also get certain other software that will make their working better. We'll be discussing what exactly is this satellite all about. Then the Great Nicobar Project, the government of India, as you know, few years back announced a Great Nicobar Project undertaking the development of the Nicobar Island. The Problem here is many people are alleging that this might lead to displacement of a lot of tribal people. And in the end, we'll be discussing what Sri Lanka's ambulance service, which was gifted by India and this is not in the right condition now. Sri Lanka just does not have the money and they want someone to adopt their ambulances. So these are the topics that we have for you today. Let's start with the first one. The first topic that we have is India's digital public infrastructure and what can we learn from this. Now this article is written by an IAS officer. The IAS officer here in this article is making a simple point. He is saying that in the past decade or so, there have been a lot of initiatives on the side of the government to introduce technology in our day to day lives, which has made our lives so much better. For example, there are so many examples that you can talk about. There is Aadhaar, you can talk about government initiatives such as, let's say, Digi Locker. There are government initiatives such as the UPI. There are so many of these initiatives which have made our life better. As per the author, this digital public infrastructure, digital public infrastructure in simple terms would mean infrastructure that is made by the government like UPI, Aadhaar, etc. These are not made by private agencies. These are made by the government, but they are then open to the public. Common people can use it. The government of India, as per the author, has been using a lot of these infrastructure 
and the good part is the government in fact has made it open to as many companies who want to use this technology they can without any cost do you know for example UPI was made by the government entity right the NPCI National Payment Corporation of India they made the UPI now after that whichever app for example Paytm phone pay Google pay free charge whatever app wanted to use the UPI they were allowed to take that technology from the government without paying anything so when you talk about phone pay Paytm Google pay they have not invented UPI UPI as a technology was invented by the government of India under the with the NPCI and the government has just made it open to these private organization that you can also use it this is an example of how government is making this infrastructure digital infrastructure but keeping it to open for the public so that they can also take advantage of this this is just one example the UPI there are many other examples as well Aadhaar for example has made the life of people a lot lot better the government subsidies a lot of government schemes when the government for example announces that we are depositing this much rupee to the bank account of the farmers how is it that they identify who is a farmer who is not a farmer in all these initiatives technology such as Aadhaar etc have played a major 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 role as per the author if you count the number of schemes at the center and at the state governments there are about 1700 government schemes right now that are running with the help of Aadhaar that identify their beneficiaries based on Aadhaar author says that the Aadhaar rollout would have been even quicker but right now we have faced certain hurdles if you remember the Supreme Court in a very famous case had said when he was when the Supreme Court was in the Aadhaar matter that right to privacy is a fundamental right since then public sector has still in implemented Aadhaar but private sector when you go to private sector for example acceptance of Aadhaar is still not very high I'll ask you a very simple question and I think one of you have already given the answer but let me ask this again which was this case in which the Supreme Court had said that right to privacy is a fundamental right okay I see a lot of you have already given the answer perfect so a lot of you have already given the answer that is called the G, the K.S. Puttaswamy case Justice K.S. Puttaswamy case was the famous case in which the Supreme Court had said that right to privacy is a part of fundamental some people had actually filed a case in the Supreme Court against Aadhaar so if for example I don't want my Aadhaar card to be made I don't want to share my private data my information with the government I should not be forced to do that after that the public sector still implemented Aadhaar still made Aadhaar mandatory for a lot of government schemes but private sector after that has not made Aadhaar mandatory but because of Aadhaar no one can deny that the life of a common man has been made much simpler for example even in business due to Aadhaar actually ensuring that the company's GST, GST network is all mapped to the person who's running the business has become much much easier you would have seen how the government of India is pushing everyone that linking of PAN with Aadhaar is mandatory the sad part is government has again extended the deadline the deadline was the end of the month of March but they have again extended the deadline the government wants everyone to link their Aadhaar number with their PAN card as well so that it is easy for the government to identify a certain individual and this is the case with most other nations if you have seen American movies American series you would have seen in America they have something called the social security number have you seen this in US they have something called social security number social security number in US basically is very much similar to Aadhaar every individual every citizen of the US has a certain number given to them by the government this is how the government identifies the individual the necessity is if the government tomorrow wants to run a scheme wants to give you subsidy how will the government identify who is the person eligible for subsidy how much is a person earning that is why we need to have identification of the people in form of Aadhaar or in the form of social security number the author gives other examples also of how India specifically has been making a lot of progress in this digital technology and sharing it with our public as well 
There are two examples that the author shares. One is Digi Locker and one is Digi Yatra. Now, I don't know how many of you have used Digi Locker. I personally have used Digi Locker. I usually use it. It is a very good app. It is very, very helpful. Digi Locker, in simple terms, is an app on which you can store a lot of documents like your driving license, your registration certificate of your uh, vehicle, the insurance, your education certificates also, your Aadhaar, etc. All of that can be stored in this app. And as per the law, you if let's say traffic police ask you for your license, you can show that on your phone on the DigiLocker app, it will be accepted. So it's, you can say it's more like Google Drive only on Google Drive also, you can store soft copy of your data. But DigiLocker app is more convenient, you just input your Aadhaar number, it will start to fetch documents. So DigiLocker app, again, very, very good initiative. We also have something called Digi Yatra. Now, Digi Yatra is something that many people would not really have heard about. Let me take an, let me give you an example. So, when you fly, when you go to an airport, when you are entering airport, the security will check your identity card. They will see your Aadhaar or some other card. They will match your face with that photo. If that matches only, then you will be allowed to go inside the airport. All of you would have seen this. If you have not been to an airport, this is how it works. When you are at the entrance of the airport, your security will actually check if you match with your ID, your photo only, then you'll be allowed to enter. Now, what has happened is the government of India, as an alternative to that, has started a new system called Digi Yatra. Digi Yatra will be a biometric system where your facial recognition will happen without any security. So you don't need to have security personal every single time to check to identify whether your face matches with your ID or not. Digi Yatra will be able to ensure that your facial recognition is done. Now, all these are techniques that the government is implementing for the help of the people. So India's digital push is now happening in a lot of sectors, not just in fintech, not just in Digi Locker, Digi Yatra kind of things, but Aadhaar, government subsidies, all of these. And all these are being given to the people without any cost. Digi Locker you can use without any cost. Digi Yatra again you can use without any cost. So a lot of these things you can use without any cost. In fact, in private sector also, when you make an account, let's say you want to invest money, you have to open up mutual funds or anything, you make an account on these apps, Whatever documents they require, they just ask you for permission. Can we see your digi locker or not? If you say yes, you can see my digi locker, they will automatically get your documents from digi locker. You don't have to do anything. All these have been done so that people's usual day to day life becomes better with the use of this technology. And not just the central government, many state governments also are doing this. And the great part is. Again, the example of UPI, example of DigiLocker, DigiYatra, the best part about all of these is it is developed from the side of the government, but it is available for free to be used by anyone. These companies, PhonePay, Paytm, etc. are taking the stack of UPI. Do you know what stack is? If you are from IT background, you would be very familiar with the word stack. If you don't know what is stack, so stack in very simple terms can be understood as a program or as an algorithm. So basically, when phone pay says or Paytm says we want to use uh, UPI, the government of India will say, okay, this is the software, you take this, just copy it in your app and you will be able to now use UPI. So that software the government is giving in simple terms is called a stack. So government of India has been sharing their stack of a lot of different technologies, with these companies. UPI is a prime example. UPI in fact is now finding acceptance outside India as well. You would have seen in the news how Indian government has partnered with Singapore also. Do you see that a few weeks back? Indian government partnered with Singapore that now you can use the same UPI app to make payments in Singapore as well. And these kind of agreements are now being done with other countries as well. For example, UPI transactions per month have increased to 8 billion transactions. About 65% of India's GDP per annum is happening through UPI, which is a huge, huge, huge number. Also, 
businesses are taking advantage of this upi has made the life of people much better there used to be a time earlier when you could not go out of your house without your wallet but now you can go out of your house without wallet as long as you have your phone your phone will have almost everything it will have digital lockers all your documents it will also have the upi app so even if you have to pay something it will not be a problem now this is where i want to share with you this india stack thing now what is india stack india stack again is a group of those applications which the government is open to sharing with the private sector and individuals as well in simple term this is called india stack collection of those applications interface with the government is open to use with other for example upi as i told you as an example digi locker bheem many other examples the government of india is open to sharing with the private sector to improve their lives upi for example has seen a lot of success we have discussed about the case of singapore do you know nepal by the way has implemented upi properly so with singapore they have not implemented upi with singapore the partnership we have is with our upi app we can actually transact in singapore as well but in nepal they are they have implemented our upi completely so with upi you can actually do whatever sort of payment that you want in nepal all these are examples of acceptance of our system of india stack bheem that is the government of india have for upi that can be used in countries such as bhutan singapore thailand malaysia taiwan south korea cambodia japan all these again are examples of how the government of india has been going forward by the with the use of technology i also wanted to give you some other examples of government initiatives towards e governance e governance as you know is a very important topic for gs2 mains exam in gs2 mains exam every second third year you might have a question about e governance or e governance initiatives these are some of the initiatives the government has taken i would advise you to at least try and use some of them i don't know how many of you use this app called my gov do you use this app there's an app called my gov there's a website also my gov on this app you can read about a lot of government initiatives you can interact with the government as well for example when the government is trying to introduce a law before that a lot of times the government just puts a draft of the law on the app and you can give a feedback on that government also organizes a lot of competitions in this app so there are for example singing competition there are logo competitions all these are organized by the government on this app it's a pretty good thing you can at least see it once even if you don't like it my advice would be just download it see it once for 10 15 minutes see what are the option then if you don't like you can delete it whatever you want so it is government trying to increase participation of the people for example do you know the swachh bharat logo that we have what is the logo of swachh bharat my drawing is very bad but i'll still try and draw it this logo of swachh bharat that we have it was a part of the competition that the government organized similarly do you know the rupee symbol the new rupee symbol that we have this this rupee symbol also was actually a part of government competition government organized this competition anyone in india could take part in it the winners were chosen in this so these kind of competitions also are organized by the government in the my gov app government also has the umang port app or umang basically is an app from where you can download all the other government apps such as aadhaar digi locker etc similarly you have the pay gov for which you can pay uh, any amount of money that you wanted to if you want to transfer money to any bank etc government also has an app called pay gov then we have the digi sevak platform also this is an initiative if some citizens want to join the government as a volunteer in any agency these are just some of the example these are not the only ones there are a lot of other examples of e governance initiatives from the government in the exams if you are asked a question about e governance in the mains exam it will be very helpful you can if you can quote some examples so these are just some of the example that i'm showing you there may be many many others that you would have seen apart from this as well this was our first article let's see what are the other questions that i have from the uh, people in the chat okay 
yes, Nikita. Banks also have their individual apps for UPI. Okay. Um, I have a question. Muskan is saying UPI's purpose enable to do payment from any app to different app like phone pay, Bharat pay, Paytm. Yes, so basically UPI, the apps are just acting as a platform. UPI will ensure that your money will go directly into your bank account. So for example, if you transfer money using UPI from Paytm or phone pay, money will not stay in Paytm wallet. Money will directly go into your bank account. So these intermediaries are not really uh, depositing any money. By the way, did you uh, guys see yesterday there was a news in the Hindu newspaper that there may be some tax or some fees that the government will start on UPI transactions. Did you see that? But do remember, there are a lot of other details that are yet to come. Those, the fee that the government is talking about is only for merchant based transactions. That is not for common, let's say if you are transferring money to your friends, that is not how the fee will be charged. Fee will only be charged for merchant based transaction. Anyway, so please try and uh, see if you can actually get a lot of details about that. Government is still trying to decide final details about who will be charged, how much will be charged. UPI has always remained an important topic for prelims also, for mains also. Perfect. Let's move ahead then. The second important topic that we have as we were discussing is mainly about the right of the workers. the right of the workers. Now across the world, and this is a very old phenomenon, it's not a new phenomenon, across the world, it is well accepted that the best way for the workers to ensure that their demands are met is to strike. Now strike of the workers is a very old phenomenon, it's a very very old phenomenon. Now it has been happening in India as well, right now there are strikes in many parts of the country, why? Because many workers are demanding that we have to go back to the old pension scheme. Now difference between the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme I will not discuss today because we have discussed it at least 15-20 times in the past few months. Because there are a lot of articles about new pension scheme, old pension scheme, the difference between the two. We have done a lot of articles on that so let's not go into that. The article here is not really about old versus new pension scheme. The article is about how the government is now stopping the workers from organizing a strike. So what has happened here is a lot of states have already gone back to the old pension scheme. States which are ruled by the non-BJP party especially Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Himachal, Punjab they are going back to the old pension scheme. The other states, other states workers are now also demanding. The reason why other state workers also want to go back to the old pension scheme is the simple difference is in the old pension scheme, workers did not have to contribute anything. The government only contributed. In the new pension scheme, the workers also have to contribute something. And there are other differences as well. Now, what is happening in Maharashtra specifically is, Maharashtra also is facing worker strike. Now, how does a government react whenever the workers strike? The government reacts by using a law. There is a law in India called Essential Services Act. There's a law in India called Essential Services Act. Essential Services Act means the government of India can decide that certain services are essential for a country is working. Essential services for example can be medical services, uh, they can be let's say petrol pumps etc. They are essential. Government of India can say that these are five, six or ten essential services meaning that people working in these services will not have the right to strike. People working in these services, if they go on a strike, the government can and will take action against them. They will be dismissed immediately or whatever action the government wants. This is how the government usually responds against the right to strike. Whenever the workers start to strike, the government usually says this and this and this are essential services, you have to come back. The entire discussion over here is how does a government define what is an essential service, what is not an essential service? Because if the government decides everything is an essential service, then workers will never be able to protest. The only time that the workers' demands will be heard is when they go on a strike. As simple as that. If they don't go on a strike, their demand will not be heard. So they also want 
that we have, we should have the right to strike. Now, this is where the problem now starts. As I said, the issue is about who defines what is essential. How is it defined that the government can mark certain services, essential certain services as not essential services? Let's try and see what is the criteria. Now, internationally also, ILO, that is International Labour Organization, which looks after the interests of the workers, of the laborers, they have also said a lot of things about the right to strike. ILO says, workers enjoy the right to strike and they have the right to defend their economic and social interests. Also, public servants who exercise the right to strike right in the name of the state cannot enjoy the right to strike. Basically, in simple terms, if you are working for the government, then you do not have the right to strike. Again, let me repeat, if you are working for the government, if you are working for the state, let's say public servants, banking, etc., then you would not have the right to strike. What the ILO says, the International Labour Organization says that you do have the right to strike if you have to get all your economic interests, etc. made. Now, this is a phenomenon that we have seen in many parts of the world. It is not just India. As I told you, if you see World War I, World War II, in that era also we saw a lot of workers raising their voices against what their specific governments were doing. In India, since the time of the British, we have had this law. The British also faced a lot of strikes by the workers. The workers who demanded increasing salary, they demanded a lot of other rights. The British at that time used this Essential Services Act. Now, essential services, as I said, are those where interruption would lead to endangering life, personal liberty, health of the entire population. Also, the government thus can name services such as electricity, water supply, telephone, air traffic control usually are classified as essential services. Essential Services Act that we have in India, it's a pretty old act. It was first enacted at the time of the British. After independence, we had a new act in 1968. The aim of the act is simple, to ensure that essential materials, essential commodities are available throughout the country, utilize the distribution, ensure fair prices, and ensure that unethical trade practices are not carried on. When the government says that a specific commodity is an essential service, or it's an essential commodity, holding, price rise, etc. also stops in those kind of commodities. Now, who has the power under this act? This act is enacted under list 3 of the concurrent list. Meaning that, since it is in the concurrent list, both the center and the states have the power to make laws on this. So, we have a central government law also for essential services. Then, respective state governments also have their own laws about essential services. Respective state governments also have identified which will be essential service, which will not be essential service. Maharashtra, for example, in this case, this article, which uh, the case in which article has been written, Maharashtra has been using their own state law. It is a central and a state prerogative because it is in the concurrent list. Do remember that as well. Meaning that every state maintain their own list as well of what will be the essential services. It's not just the center government, the state government also has this. Now, apart from this, usually, what are the essential commodities? Usually, services related to sanitation, water supply, etc., essential services. This is the first category. Then, communication, transport are also usually in this category. Any establishment dealing with production of essential supplies such as coal, power, steel will also be under this category. The objective is, employees cannot refuse to work in this particular sector. In fact, employees cannot even refuse to work over time if it is required. Please understand this. In this sector, if any employee says I'm going on strike, the employee can be dismissed, the employee will lose all the benefits, the employee officially cannot go on a strike, cannot leave work if you're working in this sector. If you're asked to work over time, even then you can work it. And that is why there has been a lot of demand that we should actually change this law 
because the governments whenever workers start to organize a strike the government start using this kind of a law to bring back the workers into the working condition once again and this is what is happening in Maharashtra as well for now this is why this article has been written let's see if you have any questions before we move on Kishan is saying what if the worker, government worker victimized of exploitation by government itself. Then you can go to the court. Then you can uh, basically use the law if you think that as per the law you are being exploited. Go to the court. That is how it works. I know it is not fair but usually this is how it works. Maleshwaram is saying example of ESMA. Malish, uh, Maheshwar example of ESMA is again I am not sure what you mean by example it is a law so there are no examples of the law but if you are asking what are the kind of services which are essential under this law I gave an example hospital related services transport related services all these are essential services so there is a staff working in the hospital that staff says we are going on strike that will not be allowed if the government uses this act that is how it works Ayush is saying how is it relevant for the prelims? Ayush is it, it is relevant about this act. Questions can be asked about this specific essential uh, services act. Ashu is saying retired judge has a right to strike. Ashu, those people organize strike who are working. Retired people will organize strike from there. From where exactly? Or for what are they striking about? If there is a retired person, he can not strike. Strike means I will not come to work. That is what is the meaning of strike. So what will the retired people strike about? There is no connection between the two, are you understanding? When you say I am striking, I am going on a strike, you mean that I am boycotting something, I will not come here, I will not work. But if someone is retired, what will they strike about, right? Okay, let's move on then. The next important news that we have here is about Russia-Belarus nexus. Now, Russia-Belarus nexus is a problem that the entire European continent is facing. As you would know, we have discussed a bit in detail earlier as well. Belarus actually is considered as the last remaining dictatorship of Europe. Let me repeat that. Belarus is considered as the last remaining dictatorship of Europe. Belarus was a part of USSR. Since USSR broke up, Belarus still is considered to be very, very close to Russia. Belarus is ruled by Mr. Lukashenko, this is the person, Alexander Lukashenko, who has been in power for many, many, many years. He organizes elections, but those elections are like, he gets 98% votes, 99% votes. The remaining people who don't vote for him, either are sent to jail or they are not, they don't even live till the next elections. It is because of Russia only that Belarus has been able to work as a dictatorship in Europe right now. All the other European countries understand this fact but no one has been able to show anything because Belarus has had a lot of support from Russia. Now what has happened is Russia has announced a couple of days back that they will be placing their nuclear weapons in Belarus. This has angered a lot of other European countries. They say that this should not have been done. Russia is doing this in response actually to America and other Western countries supplying their arms to Ukraine. As you know, Ukraine is getting a lot of help from USA. USA has sent help worth over 50 billion dollars so far for Ukraine. Ukraine has also been getting a lot of weapons from other Western nations, European nations mainly. Russia in response to that now is increasing its own air so sphere of influence. Let me first show you the map before we come back to this. If you look at this map, just try and understand the situation of Europe right now. This is Russia. So Russia's neighbor is Belarus. And then there is Ukraine. I am not very good with drawing but this is somewhere. So Kyiv is somewhere here. Ukraine's capital Kyiv is somewhere here. So even when the Ukraine-Russia war started, Russia or Russian army entered Ukraine not just from here. Russian army entered Ukraine from Belarus as well so that they could be very close to Kyiv. So Russia's plan to attack Kyiv was through Belarus only. Now the problem here is if Belarus has Russia's nuclear weapons, Belarus now shares a boundary with those countries which are NATO members such as Latvia. 
Lithuania, all these countries which are NATO members, which are European countries, they are now scared. They don't want a country with which they share a border to have nuclear weapons with them. But Russia is saying we are giving them nuclear weapons because America and European countries are also doing the same. Russia's plan is they will place their tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Now what are tactical nuclear weapons? Tactical nuclear weapons are considered as small nuclear weapons basically. Not huge, they can still have a lot of destruction but not of large scale destruction. These are tactical nuclear weapons. Mr. Putin is saying that I am doing this because Britain is supplying armor piercing ammunition to Ukraine which has depleted uranium. So Russia is saying we are very angry because UK is also supplying a lot of things to Ukraine that will harm our army, that will harm our military. So we will also now put some pressure on the other western nations. Russia already has helped Belarus in upgrading its warplanes also so that Belarus warplanes can also carry nuclear weapons now. As I said earlier, Belarus right now remains the last dictatorship of Europe which entire European uh, continent actually now knows. This is why Belarus is so 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 important for all the other parts of Europe. Now if you look at the history of Belarus you will realize Belarus was a part of USSR. It was only after Belarus became or Belarus left USSR that it became an independent country but even then the relationship with Russia has been very very close. Since they were a part of USSR, Belarus right now almost all of their population is Russian speaking. In fact there have been so many instances of how Belarus uh, leader let us Lukashenko behaves. There was an incident about a couple of years back. There was an airplane, a civilian airplane flying over Belarus. Airplane actually had an individual who was a critic of, Bel of Lukashenko. That airplane of a commercial airline was actually forced to land in Belarus. There were fighter jets that surrounded the plane. The plane landed in Belarus. That critic of Lukashenko was taken out of the plane, jailed and then the plane was let go. All these things are happening in Europe. Europe which actually considers itself as the most developed of all the continents, the most developed country. Now this is where Belarus is extremely important. Belarus is dubbed as very very friendly to Russia. Whatever Russia says Belarus except Belarus has been the only country that has been openly supporting Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They have been helping with Ukrainian or Russian army as well. A lot of Russian army is placed in Ukraine. That is where the NATO members are angry. Now there were instances in the past where Belarus and Russia had some problems. However in the past couple of years all those problems have been solved. In the past couple of years we have seen how Ukraine and Russia or Belarus and Russia I'm sorry have been working together. In the UN assembly as well whenever in the UN security council if there is any resolution against Belarus you will always see Russia supporting Belarus. Even when Russia is criticized by all the countries across the entire world Belarus is one country that will never actually criticize them. There was a small period of time where Belarus was starting to shift towards western countries but Vladimir Putin again forced Belarus back into their country. The only reason why Belarus still works as a dictatorship, the only reason why Belarus is still being able to operate like this where they have fair, unfair elections where 95-98% people are forced to vote in favor of one single person is because Vladimir Putin, Russia actually has so much impact on Belarus. Now, the reason I am showing this map to you is as you know in the prelims there will always be one or two map based questions every single year. Usually the nations that remain in the news from those nations we usually have map based questions. So I would highly advise you to make a list of the countries that share a border with Belarus so that you can easily answer these questions. So for example Ukraine, Russia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland these are the countries that share a border with Belarus so please do make a note of that. These are important especially the places in the news their map based questions are very very easily asked. Now as I told you this entire news is about tactical weapons, tactical nuclear weapons. What is the difference between strategic nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons? Strategic basically are those which are large scale weapons 
that can cause a large scale damage means wipe out the entire city wipe out the entire uh, area tactical nuclear weapons are for specific targets small scale specific targets for example as per the scientist one kiloton or less should be called a tactical nuclear weapon there is no one specific definition for this different people can have different definition but the simple idea is tactical nuclear weapons will be the smaller ones for small targets while the strategic ones will be the large ones so russia right now wants to place tactical nuclear weapons and russia is saying that don't lecture us talk to america because america also places its nuclear weapons in the nato nations we should not just think about one side of the story yes russia is doing this but it's not that russia is the first country to do this america for a long time has placed its nuclear weapons in many different nato power or nato friendly nations so nato nations also have american nuclear weapons so russia is saying let america take them back we will also not do the same but we should have the same kind of equation between the two the next important article that we have is india's problem that may increase in the future the problem of solar panel waste or solar photovoltaic waste now what exactly is the problem as you know india is continuously increasing its solar power generation capacity number of solar cells that we have uh, adopted that we have installed in india are increasing at a very very fast pace and that is in line with our goal if we have to achieve net zero by 2070 if we have to increase our generation of renewable energy we have to focus a lot on solar so all that is good but the problem here what we are not realizing is once the solar panels are at the end of their life how do you recycle them how do you dispose them that is still something that we have not been able to solve now why am i saying that this problem will increase in the future please understand this usually solar cells or solar cells depending upon how uh, how are they made usually they have a life of let's say about 15 to 20 years so solar cells would usually have a life of 15 to 20 years now if you see india's progress in solar panels india's progress in solar panels mainly started near 2008 9 10 that was the era that we actually started focusing on solar cells so most of the solar panels that india still has are in their first life cycle by the end of this decade means by 2030 by 2031 32 that is when india will have a lot of solar panels that have lived their life now they have to be recycled this is where india's problem will become very big other western nations are already in this problem because they have been using solar for a long time since india started using solar late that is why now we have an issue that going on in the coming eight to ten years we will have a lot of solar waste at our hands and we need to be ready for that beforehand as well now as i told you india is right now the world's fourth largest solar power generator in the past few years our capacity of solar power generation has increased considerably and because of that the government of india now has a challenge on its hands in the coming days if you see the solar power cells most of the solar powers that we actually have these panels have silicon most of it then there's also cadmium that is used in these solar power cells most of these components of the solar power cells can actually be derived out and it can be reused in something else but that is not that easy you require skills for that you require disassembling of these solar panels so that you can use that chemical once again in some other application this is something called round economy i don't know how many of you would have heard this phrase there's a phrase called round economy round economy basically in simple terms means that if there is one component whose life ends it should be recycled reused in something else then that should be recycled to use in something else that is round economy or circular economy this is how you actually make use of all these elements the simple idea is to ensure that 
waste of first cycle does not or is used in the second cycle then whatever waste produced in the second stage should be used in the third stage so on and so forth this is what is circular economy or round economy this is the idea that the government has been working on that whatever waste that we produce from these kind of solar panels that should be utilized in something else else well now the government of india does have certain initiatives in this regard for example some portion of the solar frames are extracted and they are sold as scrap then all the chemicals that we have silicon etc are also extracted and they are used in some other application however as per a 2021 report only half of the materials are being recovered it's not very easy to recover all the materials from the solar panels some of that may be recovered some of that may not be recovered the problem also is that it has a lot of harmful chemicals that may impact human and wildlife as well for example sulfur dioxide hydrogen fluoride hydrogen cyanide all of that may be released in the atmosphere because of mishandling of these kind of panels and this is where the government has to focus on all these problems as i told you will become even bigger in the coming 8 to 10 years when india's first cycle of the solar panel comes to an end because india right now is in the cycle where we started installing most of our solar panels very recently most of them have not come at the end of their life cycle once they come at the end of their life cycle this is where the problem starts there are a lot of gaps in our waste management system of mainly solar panels first these pv pv means photovoltaic these photovoltaic waste have to be treated differently as compared to other waste they are not the same as other kind of waste they have a different type of procedure secondly the waste generated has to be classified as hazardous waste it is hazardous if it comes in touch with humans or animals and we need to have more domestic r&d why see although india's solar energy generation has increased most of our solar panels are just still being imported from china china is the world's largest producer of solar panels they are the ones who produce it they are the ones who actually supply it all around the world when we make these solar panels in india itself it will also help us in recycling we will also ensure that the waste product of one solar panel can be used in the second one right now we are not being able to use it because a lot of this r and d and manufacturing of solar panel happens in china and not in india so we have to increase the production as well this is how maybe we would be able to make sure that our solar waste is recycled and recovered in a better way i'll also share some examples of other nations what are they trying to do for example european union they have something called waste electrical and electronic equipment directive that makes it a responsibility of the manufacturers or the distributor only to recycle this way see most of the countries have the same kind of law they make it the responsibility of the company who has made the solar panel that once the life is over the company has to take it back and they are the ones who have to dispose it similarly in uk uk has something called take back and recycling scheme where all these producers will have to submit the data to the government how many let's say solar panels they have sold how many they have taken back most of these countries have ensured that the responsibility is on the producer only usa has state wise laws there is no one particular central government law there are state wise law for how to handle solar cells australia has also announced 2 million dollars as an investment fund to develop an industry about recycling of these kind of panels japan and south korea again leaders of these solar panels they have also tried to make laws about this particular problem so there is no one single idea that all the nations around the world are adopting every nation is trying to see how exactly can we go ahead with this india also for most of our electronic equipment india still has a law that the producer has the responsibility that is called epr epr is extended producer responsibility for example do you know when you buy a tube light or when you buy the led bulb etc if you see very clearly on the packaging the led bulb will say once it expires give it back to the company because you don't know how to get rid of it you will just throw it in your dustbin then you don't know where it goes exactly 
in India also the companies do have the responsibility as well that is called extended producer responsibility so the producer of the equipment has the responsibility to recycle it so Philips etc they have the responsibility they have to take it back from you and they will only have to recycle it. but in India it doesn't really happen on a large scale these are the important topics from the mains examination point of view let's now move on to a few new stories that are factual in nature, that are important from the prelims point of view specifically. First important news story, Indian Army will get satellite to get much more, much improved data. As for the Ministry of Defense, they have signed a few deals with number one, Bharat Electronics Limited, and they have signed some deals with other organizations as well, such as the New Space India Limited. Now basically what have they done? Indian Army has said that number one, they will get a communication satellite called GSAT-7B. They will be given the satellite by NSIL, which is an arm of ISRO only. Apart from that, the Indian Army will also get something called Project Akash Tir. Project Akash Tir. Let me tell you what these are. So mainly the article talks about number one project Akash Teer. Akash Teer is an automated defense control and reporting system. It will empower the air defense units of the Indian Army. It will enable low level airspace, battle areas, etc. So if in our airspace, if there is an incursion, if there is someone who is coming into our airspace, we would be able to detect them in a better way. This is called project Akash Teer. Second, we have something called Sarang system. This is also something that the Indian Army will be taking. Sarang system is for the helicopters of the Indian Navy. Please do remember this. Sarang system is for the helicopters of the Indian Navy. It will ensure that it's an electronic support measure to make a helicopters much better. When they are going ahead on any recce, they will be able to understand the area around them much better with the help of the Sarang systems. Both of these are made in India. Then there is the satellite that we were talking about. The satellite is GSAT-7B. This will be communication satellite for the army. As you know, the armed forces, the military personnel, when they communicate on their walkie-talkie channel, etc., they want all that to be cryptic. They don't want anyone to be able to listen to this. That is why the government of India, Defense Ministry more specifically, has been focusing on these. Project Akashti, Sarang system. These are important for the prelims examination. In prelims, very often you see two to three questions from defense more specifically. In defense, you will see questions based on missiles. Also questions based on any new acquisition that the armed forces are doing. If we are, let's say, buying some new weapon system from any country or if we are making some new weapon system within the country, on those also questions can be asked in the prelims examination. The satellite that we are talking about is the advanced communication satellite called GSAT-7B. This will help the Indian Army in ensuring beyond the line of sight communication. So if the troops are far away, even then they would be able to communicate also. This geostationary satellite will be about 5 ton satellite. It has been made by ISRO for the Indian Army. So all these three, that is Sarang system, Akash Teer and the advanced communication satellite, all of these are indigenously built, indigenously made in India, acquired by the Indian Army from India. So it is also a part of the Make in India initiative where the government of India wants to ensure that most of our defense equipments are made in India built in India and should be ready for export as well. The next article that we have is about the Great Nicobar project. Now the Great Nicobar project as you know is a project where the government of India wants to build a lot more infrastructure in the Great Nicobar Island specifically. Whenever such infrastructure projects are being built there are always doubts what will happen to the wildlife of that area, what will happen to the tribals living in that area. So there are allegations here as well. The government is saying that no evictions of tribals will happen with this project. The government is saying that we will ensure that no one is vacated. This is a statement made by Ministry of Tribal Affairs. This project is being implemented by Andaman and Nicobar Islands Integrated Development Corporation. This project will include an airport, power plant, greenfield township as well. Now as you know, 
the great nicobar island mainly has a tribe called the shompen tribe the shompen tribe are a part of particularly vulnerable tribal groups among the scheduled tribes in india we have identified certain tribes as pvtg particularly vulnerable tribal groups that are even more vulnerable than scheduled tribes one of them was the shompen initiative one of them is the shompen tribe shompen tribe mainly are the ones that inhabit this nicobar island now please understand and for, let me first show you the map and then you will be able to come back to it better basically when we say andaman and nicobar island these are group of islands these are not just one island so for example this mainly is the andaman island that is towards the south or towards the north towards the south we have the nicobar island among the nicobar islands also the one at the south most end is the great nicobar so this is the great nicobar island the great nicobar island is at the southmost of this entire group of islands at the north we have andaman at the south we have nicobar in the south also this is you can see here the southmost that will be the great nicobar island this great nicobar island is india's southmost point this is where we have the indra point indra point is officially the southernmost point of india this is very very close to indonesia if you go to great nicobar you are just 150 kilometers away from indonesia as you can imagine the nicobar and the andaman if you have not been there if you go to uh, andaman is where usually people go if you have been to nicobar nicobar is the home to two national parks there is a biosphere reserve as well there are a lot of tribals who live there for example the shompen tribe the nicobari tribals and interestingly there are some people from the armed forces also retired armed forces personnel who have been living there so government of india has settled many retired armed forces personnel also in these islands for example there are so soldiers from punjab maharashtra andhra pradesh who were settled in these islands in 1970s a total of 836 islands are in the bunch of andaman and nicobar these andaman nicobar islands most of these are uninhabited most of these do not have any human population a few of them have human population mainly and mostly when you go to let's say to for tourism purposes mostly you go to andamans you mostly don't go to nicobar it is the andaman that is much more open to tourism as such the government now wants to ensure that we have equal development in the great nicobar island as well and this is what this project is all about this is the component or these are the different components of the great nicobar development project the government wants to build a green field city green field city means city built from the scratch the government wants to have an international container transshipment terminal so build a port also for ships then the government wants an international airport as well a power plant and a township for personnel who will implement the project these are some of the initiatives taken by the government of india in the past few years the government has realized the importance of andaman nicobar lakshadweep etc these small islands basically are india's permanent aircraft carriers these are those aircraft carriers that cannot be destroyed countries that have these small island properties are very lucky because these small island properties can be extremely strategic if they are used properly that is why the government of india also has been increasing its focus on andaman nicobar and in lakshadweep as well in the past few years the last one that we have here for you is about sri lanka's ambulance service so the government of india had gifted an ambulance service to sri lanka a few years back this was called 1990 ambulance service this was a number of ambulance service it was it started by a grant from india it got expanded again by a grant from india but right now since sri lanka is in a very very bad economic situation sri lankan government cannot run this ambulance service anymore they are asking their own people if anyone would like to adopt these ambulances this service that sri lankan government has sri lankan government is offering if any rich person would like to adopt any ambulance one ambulance for example can be adopted for about 12 and a half lakh rupees as you know sri lanka has been going for imf loans time and time again recently the imf promised that we will give you 3 billion dollars of package but that will also come into stages india on the other hand has been helping sri lanka with a lot of things as i discussed earlier this ambulance service of 1990 as it is called 
first started in 2016 with 88 ambulances from the side of the Indian government. Then the Indian government two years later gave another set, gave another grant to Sri Lanka mainly for these ambulances. Even the people who operate these ambulances, all of these are trained in India only. So it's one of those initiatives that government of India has been helping Sri Lanka with. It is not that our help to Sri Lanka started just because of this economic crisis. Our help to Sri Lanka has been going on for a long, long time. And this 1990 ambulance service is another example of that. As you can see here, this is a couple of years back when Sri Lanka thanked India, the Prime Minister, for giving grants to free ambulance service. But that seems to now be in trouble because it just don't have money for this free ambulance service. This brings us to the end of today's discussion of the important topics. There are a few important questions I would like you to write answers to as always. See if you are able to write these answers in about 250 words or so. First is about the workers right to strike and second is about India's digital public infrastructure. You can use our students answer writing portal as well where you can see each other's answers, give feedback to each other, learn from each other's mistakes as well. Thank you so much for joining in. I'll see you tomorrow now. 10 a.m. once again. Please make sure you are here. Also reminding you about 6 p.m. Saturday workshop live which will be on the Baiju's exam prep app. Thank you so much. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.